Morning, morning, morning. What up, y'all? Baptized Sunday up in the hizzy. That doesn't come very often, just in case you were wondering. Hey, my name is Roy, one of the pastors here at City Light Bennington, where we multiply Jesus-centered, spirit-led disciples, and Lord willing, one day, churches. Amen? Okay, so 2020, we would all acknowledge, was a year where we watched the most TV ever. No? No one's going to confess that? One of the, the, the most seen documentaries ever was something called The Last Dance. came out in 2020, and it chronicled on ESPN the 90s Bulls teams in which Michael Jordan ended up leading the Bulls to six championships. Yep, we got one dude who's a Bulls fan back there. Getting a little feedback up here. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Scottie Pippen, by the way, was the sidekick to Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan overshadows Scottie Pippen throughout the whole documentary. Actually, Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player ever. When I brag on Jesus, if the room does not clap for Jesus, I will know I did not do my job, right? Okay. <laughs> Scotty Pippen gets overshadowed, and in recent, recent mo- months, actually, he's came out publicly and said he's the most undervalued and underrated player in NBA history. Super humble of him. <laughs> and it started to make me think, man, what, what else is underrated in our culture and undervalued? So I thought to myself, well, I'll start off with fast food joints, and this, this may be probably the harshest word I may give for some of y'all to receive this morning, but dare I say, I suggest that McDonald's is the most undervalued fast food restaurant in the nation. Okay? Nope. Okay, it's okay. We, there's grace there. I'm just saying, I can make an argument that I won't take time this morning to do. Okay, I started to think of actors, and you know who, who in my opinion is the most undervalued actor in American cinema? Not Tom Cruise, that's for sure. (laughs) Nicolas Cage. Okay? Okay, I'm just saying. People, I mean, I don't think we give them as much credit. Have you seen Con Air? I mean, that's an anointed movie from the 90s. I'm just saying. But it had me then think on deeper levels, and, and now I'm getting more serious. You know, there are plenty of forms of companionship in our culture. And dare I say biblically, and by observation, the most undervalued form of companionship is marriage. The most undervalued, underrated, and underappreciated, and dare I say, disrespected ways of companionship the most is marriage. You know, throughout our culture, we've seen trends statistically that show and verify what I just said. More and more people who are married are actually okaying those who have another lifestyle, those who, for instance, another companionship way of life is living together or dating without getting married, not making a lifelong commitment. You see, those are on the rise, and it's not only normal nowadays, but it's celebrated. It's just a part of our culture. And in this room, I know this is going to be a delicate subject because a lot of us, before we got married, lived together. Some of us right now are currently living together. Some of us have used sex to abuse, and some of us, if not majority of this room, have been manipulated, hurt, or have hurt someone else through sex, whether it be being married or not. And so I just want to say, you're not going to hear from me this morning or from this pulpit condemnation or shame. You won't hear in terms of shame, guilt, or condemnation that you need to repent and turn away from a lifestyle of having sex outside of marriage. No, that's actually not what I'm here for. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, we actually have the writer end up saying, honor marriage. And so this morning, what we're gonna do is honor marriage as God's design for creation. And that being the most satisfying companionship that a human being could ever experience is sex within marriage, a union, a covenant made between partners for a lifelong commitment. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to contrast by taking uh, statistics and comparing marriages versus other forms, lesser forms of companionship. That way we'll be bought in that much more in honoring marriage And no more buying into the lie, the culture lie, that marriage is just as equal or living together is just as equal to marriage. And secondly, 
I want to honor marriages from within the marriage. And so what we're going to go through is talking through how you spouses can value God within your marriage, how you can honor marriage by honoring one another. Does that sound fair? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it doesn't return void. And I'm asking, God, that you would convince those who are living together, God, to reconsider, to look at your good design, God, to look at their hearts, uh, where they've fallen short, and that they would do business with you. God, I thank you for your love, extravagant love that pours out forgiveness, so on. And God, I'm just asking for the person in this room uh, who is hesitant right now because of the introduction of this sermon, that you would soften their hearts and that they would hear from you ultimately. And I'm asking that you would bolster and strengthen the marriages that are honoring you right now. And God, I'm asking that you would give us a greater value and appreciation for the gift of marriage. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, friends, so we're gonna be in Hebrews chapter 13, verse four, and it says this, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. The main purpose of marriage is companionship. That is the main purpose of marriage. In Genesis, we end up seeing the creation account, and after each and every day, God created, and then he said it was good, that's right. And then we see that awesome rhythm. God created and he said that it was good. And then when he finished his creation, he looks at Adam, the first man who was alone, and you know what he ends up saying? It's not good. And so the purpose of two sexes is actually companionship in marriage. Look with me, Genesis 2, verse 18. Then the Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. And then we see shortly that there's no gap in between God creating woman and taking woman to Adam for them to end up having a companionship that is anything other than marriage and sex within marriage. I mean, those two are synonymous. It's like Eve is created and boom, straight into a marriage covenant with Adam. Look with me here, Genesis 2, verse 22. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. God created marriage as the ultimate form of companionship. The ultimate in, con- in comparison and contrast to any other type of relationship that you could have outside of marriage, whether it be living together, where, whether it be dating, non-committal, whatever, girlfriend for whatever, boyfriend for however, all of those forms pale in comparison to the satisfying design of marriage. If you don't believe me, then you can look at Pew Statistics. I'm sorry, I don't actually have the graphic for this, but go to, we well, can put into uh, Google research, uh, Pew research institution and then next you can put in cohabiting and here we're just going to use this poll in 2019 to end up that much more telling the truth statistically from culture that marriage is more indifferent than cohabiting in 2019 approximately 10,000 people ended up getting surveyed and they were made up of marrieds and couples who were cohabiting and the statistics are fascinating these are the three things that you end up learning Married adults have higher levels of satisfaction in their relationship. Okay, this is what it looks like. 50% of marriage reported their relationship was going great versus 41 for cohabitors. Now, the next one we learn is married couples have a higher level of trust that their partner or spouse won't cheat on them. Okay, 84% of marriage reported that they trust their spouse to be faithful, 71% for cohabitors. The next thing that we learn is married adults have a higher trust in their significant other to make decisions that are based off of their best interest, their partner's best interest. And so what we end up seeing is 74% of marrieds reported that they trust that their spouse has their best interest in mind, meaning their partner, versus 58 for cohabitors. In comparison to cohabiting, marriage blows it out of the water in terms of in terms of companionship. And I can't help but think, could it be a testimony? It's because that's how God designed companionship. Could it be 
that the scriptures are not only true when you're in tough times and you're going through some stuff and you look at Romans 8, 28 and you say that everything works for you and your best interests because you love God and are called according to his purpose. What if we took that same mindset and we looked over at the other scriptures and that they testify that God's law is, law, is life-giving and that marriage is honoring to God not getting married and having sex outside of marriage is dishonoring. Could it be that we could trust him in both? Could it be that we could trust God's design in everything? I think the statistics end up bearing witness that much more outside of scripture, which we don't even need that as evidence, that companionship within marriage is just better. And to be objective, if you notice, in everything, even the marrieds didn't end up giving a 100%. Like there wasn't 100% on anything, the highest was 84%, and that was married couples trusting that their spouse wouldn't cheat on them. So even there, there's 16% of those married couples who actually didn't feel the same way. And it's because this, we're all messy, broken people. At the foot of the cross, there is only one perfect person. And marriage was never intended for us to find wholeness the deepest wholeness that we can ever experience is a marriage, a surrender, and a relationship with our creator, Jesus. Amen? So let's not make, in this sermon, what make marriage out to be what it wasn't intended to be. It's an amazing thing, God honoring the best form of companionship that you could find out there because that's how God designed companionship in a monogamous, heterosexual marriage and lifelong commitment between two people. But at the end of the day, we're always gonna disappoint one another, even within marriage. But I'll, I'll tell you this much, it's way better than living together or any other form of companionship. And that's not condemnation. I'm just reporting the facts and trying to give God glory in his design. And by the way, for anyone who's single, has been single, maybe divorced and is single, there is a gift that we know scripturally that is given to people to be single. So I want you to be recognized that if you're, you're, you're arguing with God between what's wrong with me and I don't want you to feel condemnation for feeling like, well, marriage is like the thing that I have to end up getting into. Well, God gifts certain people for seasons that may be long or short and also for a lifelong celibacy. And so we praise God for people who's been gifted in that unique way. And I just want to show honor by saying that's a real thing, but I also want to say to, for the most of us, we haven't been gifted that way, and this sermon for the most part is for you. And so you can have confidence that marriage is the most satisfying type of companionship. We, we honor marriage not only by that, by, by also talking to us spouses. And ultimately, the greatest thing that we could ever do in honoring marriage scripturally is spouses for you to value one another more than any other relationship that you have. Simply valuing one another in thought, attitude of heart, and in action is the way that you and, and me and within my marriage end up honoring God. You see, your marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Husbands, you are supposed to sacrificially love your brides, to sacrificially will her good as Christ did for the church, your representation of Christ. Brides, you're to submit to your husbands in everything as the church submits to Christ in everything. It's a beautiful picture. And one missing ingredient that I, I wanna actually focus on this morning and the reason in my personal opinion and observation, which is overlooked too often, of why within our marriages that we don't value one another above every other relationship is because husbands do not have a jealousy for their brides. The reason why I value my children in seasons more than my bride, the reason why I value entertainment more than spending time with my bride, the reason why I value work more than my bride is because I lack a jealousy for my bride. Born again husband, you know what one of the most Christ-like things that you could do is? Be jealous for your bride as Christ was for you and the church. We look at jealousy and we say, oh, we can't do that. 
That's a sin. I'm not talking about a worldly jealousy. I'm not talking about us in adolescence and in dating relationships where we didn't belong to one another, where pettiness and insecurity was the motivation behind our jealousy. No, I'm talking about a Christ-like jealousy that is godly. Look with me in the scriptures. Exodus 34, verse 14. So we're going back to the old covenant days before Jesus ended up incarnating himself. And during that time, God ended up picking a people, Israel, and he ends up making a covenant partnership with them to be their God. And he ends up saying this once they've said yes to one another, which is a symbolism of our marriage. He ends up saying, this is God's voice. You must worship no other gods for the Lord, whose very name is Jealous, is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. Men, I could give you advice on lowering your screen time. I could give you advice on going on date nights. But what we lack is a jealousy for our bride. That's what we lack. I could give you something to change your behaviors, but at the end of the day, guess what? It ain't going to last long. But you know what we need? We need a godly jealousy as Christ has for us, for our brides. Amen? Are you catching what I'm putting down, husbands? Husbands, when you get a jealousy for your bride, you won't let your kids dishonor her, whether it be in front of you or when you return from work. When you get a godly jealousy, you won't let schedules dictate your intimacy with your bride. And you will forsake the world come hell or high water if anyone dishonors or disrespects her. That, my friend, is motivated by jealousy, a godly jealousy for your bride, a jealousy that wants her time, a jealousy that wants her affection, a jealousy that wants her attention because you belong to one another. Don't let the culture end up telling you you don't got no spine. Have a jealousy for your bride as Christ does for the church. There gotta be a spirit-filled Christian up here in the here that could give an amen to that, I'm just saying. (laughs) It starts with the husband. You get a jealousy for your bride, chain of command, and you just watch how your bride flourishes when you end up separating a kid who's disrespecting her in front of you. You end up seeing the tone and the temperature and the climate of your household when you end up taking a stand for your bride. Watch how that jealousy ends up manifesting itself into an amazing love and intimacy between you and your bride. Could you imagine, friends, if we had that type of jealousy with the husbands here at City Light Bennington? The amazing things that we could end up doing, the amazing permissions that husbands would end up getting to end up doing things that much. Could you imagine, everyone wants this. Ladies, just so you know, us husbands, we want scriptures to be true about you speaking highly of us. And husbands, a jealousy for your bride, wanting her attention, time, and affections, and not letting anything come in between that and rescheduling everything and prioritizing our brides is the pathway to get to the heart of things. Value marriage by putting your spouse above everything, by being jealous for your spouse. And the last way we end up valuing marriage is by remaining faithful. Look back with me in the scriptures. We'll pick it back up. Hebrews 13, verse 3. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. I was never a faithful guy before I came to Christ and before I got married. I was always looking for, like, literally who was next in terms of objectifying while I was in relationships. And when I met the love of Christ when I was a freshman down at UNL, he changed me from the inside out. And by the way, if you ever want to read the scriptures after you get born again, it's a fascinating thing. I ended up reading in the Old Covenant in the book of Hosea. And you end up seeing that God ends up telling this man, Hosea, to end up going and pursuing an adulterous bride, Gomer. Gomer was his bride, and she was willingly leaving and sleeping with other men and selling herself to prostitution while she was married to Hosea. And do you know what God ended up telling Hosea? He said, go after her. Go after her, and he does. And the whole lesson is that 
Hosea's pursuit of an unfaithful, adulterous bride is the way that God pursued his people Israel, just like us, who have worshipped other gods, who have cheated on God, and who have been adulterous towards God. We see a faithful God in the book of Hosea, represented through Hosea's obedience, despite our adultery. And Hosea's Gomer, Gomer's consistent tendency to want to sleep around and cheat on Hosea is a representation of you and I whenever we go to other forms of worship. I started to see my unfaithfulness towards God and I was going back to making idols of women and of football and I started to become undone because I started to see God's faithfulness through the book of Hosea. And it changed me because I started to see my prostitution and my unfaithfulness. Spouses, the encouragement is to remain faithful to one another as your God has remained faithful to you. In the times where we've gone and we've gone to other places for satisfaction, in the long seasons or short seasons, God is still with you and he's pursuing you. And he's made promises over your life since you've let Jesus run your life that your God is a God who stays. Your God made promises that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And those are ones you can put your bottom dollar on. When you said yes to Christ, you said yes to a God who stays, and that's what he wants us to reflect within our marriages. And it's not just about sleeping outside of marriage, that type of adultery. It's about continuing to have sex within marriage. Yes, every married couple ended up going, yeah, didn't know we were going to go there. It's not just about not stepping outside of your marriage, but the encouragement also today in remaining faithful is actually still having sex within your marriage. Pastor David Guzik says it this way, the enemy of our souls wants to do everything he can, catch this, to encourage sex outside of the marriage bed. And then he wants to do everything he can to discourage sex within the marriage bed. You end up seeing a scripture up here that testifies in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3 through 5, that our bodies, they belong to one another. We belong to one another. When we said yes to the covenant of marriage, we said yes to our bodies not being totally autonomous anymore, but we actually had to say within our marriages over what we'll do with, it, with our bodies. Don't deprive each other of sexual intimacy. Christ gave up his body. If you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he gave up his body on the cross, but in the Garden of Gethsemane, he confessed he didn't want to do it. And yet he still ended up sacrificing for our good. In the same way, would we take on that mentality to will our spouse's good by giving up our bodies despite what we may feel emotionally? And I know it takes so much wisdom and it takes communication, but ultimately the principle is there as you communicate and ask for God's wisdom, that we would both be sacrificing for one another. In marriage, sometimes, if I'm being honest, in every marriage would end up giving an amen, although I know no one will give an amen in here. You do it from intimacy, and sometimes you do it to stir intimacy. We got one bold spirit-filled sister up here. I'm not making any eye contact. It's just the reality, and there's no shame in that. Hebrews um, 13 verse 4 is the last thing that we're going to touch on, and we can't avoid it because it's literally connected to the message of this verse of valuing marriage, and it is a heavy warning about stepping out of your marriage and committing adultery. Hebrews 13 verse 4, God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. God is not soft on sin. At all. And it's not just this. He's not soft on sin at all. And yet, still, he's compassionate, kind, and merciful. But he's also just. And he won't let sin go. He's going to judge people who've had sex outside of marriage, outside of a monogamous, heterosexual marriage. And it's all with an understanding that God understands that sex is, is, is an amazing gift from God. Biblically speaking, it's meant to literally strengthen our bonds within our marriage. 
It's for us to be fully trusting in one another, fully seen, fully loved, fully known, without the fear of fully being left behind by our spouse. This physical, emotional, and spiritual ecstasy, it's actually pointing towards something. And that's the day when you pass on, you will be face to face with your creator. And there will be an ecstasy then and an ecstasy in the new heaven and the new earth that is inexplicable. And it will end up in comparison making the ecstasy of sex so minimal in comparison to the ecstasy that we're going to experience with being face to face with our creator. Without any sin apparent in our lives. That's how satisfying God is, and not only now, but in the life to come. The deepest form of intimacy is sex within marriage, and the enemy knows it, and he has been literally wrecking families and marriages since the dawn of day because of it, manipulating God's good gift to use as a weapon towards one another in selfishness. And my friend, God won't stand for it, when we step out of our marriages. But there is always good news. Born again, friend, if, if that has been your story and you've confessed that, you sought God and his wisdom on repenting from that, you've been forgiven. It's crazy to think about that someone could step out of marriage in a bond that is so trusting and experience a godly sorrow that makes them turn away from what they did pursue Christ and that he would forgive us. That's how scandalous the grace of God is. When you make it personal and say within your marriage that if someone stepped out on you within marriage that God would be forgiving and actually get rid of that rap sheet and wouldn't uh, hold that against them if your spouse who stepped out actually repented and turned towards Christ, you take that personally and you apply that to your marriage, you'll find out just how great the grace of God is amazing his forgiveness it's scandalous and if you've stumbled and tripped in these areas if if there's no healing that you've experienced in your life thus far god is a god of restoration redemption and healing and the first step is actually confessing turning away from that and seeking forgiveness from him god is jealous for you And he brought your life, and he bought your life on that tree. And friends, he deserves obedience in every area of our life. And so my friend who's not letting Jesus run your life, what's more satisfying than marriage, by far, is an actual relationship and union with Christ. And that comes from a confession of your weakness, of your sin against God. And then putting your trust in him to forgive you of that. And he will clean you as white as snow. And your past will be forgiven. And you'll experience a new life and a freedom and a buoyancy to your soul of joy that you've never experienced ever before. So that is what the cost is to actually experience the fulfillment of a born-again message. um, Of a born-again marriage, sorry. Father, I thank you so much for everyone who made an effort here to come and see someone who's baptized and hear the word of God. And I'm asking that you would soften hearts today for anyone who's uh, living together, God. I'm asking that you would end up convicting them in only ways that you can, without guilt, without shame, but just with an awe and worship of you, of how you gave your life, God, and how they're not giving all of themselves over to you. I'm asking that you'd soften hearts within marriages and that you would actually strengthen marriages. Uh, Would you put steel in the spine of husbands out there who would be jealous for their brides? And God, would you soften the hearts of brides regardless of the past um, outside of marriage or within marriage? Uh, I'm asking that you would soften them, God, and that they would submit to their husbands in everything as or the church did to Christ, would you end up getting that much more glory? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.